Ooh, cool. Now you can see on the left, right, what we have, and on the right, exactly the same thing, but you know, what's what's being streamed. Not very useful mm. to be completely no, honest with you. Yeah. Oh, there's a different on the actual YouTube and Twitch stream. Yeah, so so I was talking to a friend um, that, that he used to work at Twitch and he's uh, essentially doing like, um, what do you call this? Streamer Success and this company called Stream Elements. So he, he knows the ins and out of the business. And I said, hey, what if we stream both to these two places? And he said, please don't do that. Like you have to build your community in a single place. You won't be able to stream to two different platforms, mm -hmm. right? At the same time and talk to people in both places. Yeah, And it also seems that because I have become an affiliate at Twitch by contract, I'm not allowed to do that, which I didn't know. Uh, yeah. But um, anyways, I think we are live. If you give me one second, I'll try to go live on the YouTube one on the side. I'll just tell people to come here. I can. But didn't you just said that you're not allowed to do that? I'm not allowed to stream the content to both places, right? Or something oh, like that. Okay. He didn't really give me the legal tour either. Anyways, we are live. Welcome to Reasonable Coding. Uh, I'm here presenting to you with my co-hosts, Pixel Hero and Xavier Villa. Fernando and Pontus in reverse order. My name is Leandro. And today we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, what is it that we're going to talk about? The second part of? Um, the second part of the hot stuff, Rust of this. tool that you built. Yeah, the hot stuff, Rust tool. All right, so let's do a very, very quick recap in case you didn't get a chance to watch this stream. It's on YouTube. If you want to go there to, you know, the reasonable coding channel, you can watch it. I recommend you watch it in 2x because it's a little long, one and a half hours. And you can still get the gist of it, if, even if we speak fast. Do enable subtitles, because we're not, what are you called, native English speakers, so our accent might be a little hard sometimes. Uh, but yeah. Um, I built the, this tool, Hot Stuff, right, to essentially be able to publish content in a, let's say, reasonable manner. And it's really just a documentation compiler. We can open that. No, not Donna Summer. Um, it's called after the song uh, from Donna Summer, which I was just listening at the moment. It's a composable incremental, incremental turnkey document compiler. It's very, very fast. It uh, caches aggressively. It's inspired, inspired in some other build tools like Basil or Dune. It's turnkey. It doesn't really require much from you to start using it. You just um, having your markdown files, some structure, touch a couple of site files in there, and you start running it, and you're good to go. I think I probably want to kill Steam in case messages. There you go. Gone. Yeah. Um, there's an NPM package that I created since the last stream. It was not there, and we actually have uh, builds for a lot of architectures. That you can have a look at and play around with if you, so you so you wish. Um, in, in the last stream, we went through the source. We figured out how the command line tool was created and how it did some of the things it does. Um, it's going to build, gets built, and how? And then go into the hot reloading, which is you know what I think makes the tool kind of uh, nice and fun to use. The fact that you can modify some files and it figures out what changes and reloads only those in the in the browser. I don't think I can hear you. Can you hear me? Am I right? 
can hear you either on. My audio interface died. Hello? We're back. Oh my god, I was just talking and talking and uh, you, you could hear me before though? Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. That sucks. Hopefully, you got an, you understood what I said, though. Like, could you could you distinguish? All right, perfect. Yes. All right. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it is. It is what we what we have. Um, go watch the other stream if you if you haven't heard me. And today we're gonna talk about the execution of the build graph and how the hot reloading works. All right. That's uh that's what we're going to do today. Cool. Should we begin? All right. So I'll just keep the agenda down there and we're going to go to the graph build graph function. This uh might might be a little familiar. I'm I'll make this full screen now. Oops, there you go. So you should probably see the screen both on Twitch and on Discord for the two of you. Um, why do I always do this? I always forget to switch that. There you go. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, well, we have the build plan that we talked about before, the data structure that represents what we need to do. And if you remember, we were talking about um, this plan side function that goes through the entire directories, right? And creates that tree of work. So far, so good. Cool. So we can go then straight into the main file, which is the, um, the binary and keep from here. The last thing we did was to dig into this plan build function, right? That will give us a build plan. And then we either compute a diff or not, but regardless, we always execute. So today we're gonna start in the execute function. And if we go to the build plan, I guess we go to the build graph again, build executor, that's the one. Um, right, so the build executor module sort of extends the build plan data structure with one, uh, two, two new functions, execute, right? And the one that we saw before over here, it's called compute diff. We're going to skip that for now. We're going to go straight into the execute. Uh, this one actually um, takes care of iterating over itself, which, you know, it is the build plan. And if it finds a cache hit, it will just log out the cache hit as um, with the debug log. And if it finds an actual compilation unit, it will um, call compile unit, right? And then this will return a result and, you know, whether if you couldn't um, um, complete the result. Precisely, yes. So this is saying uh, this will be like in other languages, I guess, like equals hit, right? Yes, good call out. To me, this syntax is a little strange. All right, all right. Sorry, I was just trying to un unfold that. Um, yes, yes. Yes, and I'm using the vec macro to create a new empty vector. Uh, I could also use a standard vector, um, I think it's vec new. Uh, we can just, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, the, the bang essentially 
uh, is is using all macros, so all macros end with a bang. And you'll see that we have vec here, we have debug as well in this line, we have info over here. All of these are macros. I think it's mandatory. I guess everything that is mandatory is a convention as well, right? Again, it's a, but it's enforced. Oh yes, it is syntax, yes. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So the main reason for me to do this is that um, I want the output of this thing to say cache hit. Uh, that's that's really it. I could remove that and, and in the debug macro write cache hit, right? And then... Yeah, exactly, yeah. But uh, you, everything you've said so far, it makes sense. You're just sort of saying, I want to pattern match and something, but I also want the entire thing. Like with the wrapping. So. Exactly, but I want to capture it, right? Oh, it's just a compilation unit. I could have used C unit, but uh, this is just a variable name. Uh, it doesn't really clash. I mean, there is a uh, proper shadowing, as far as I understand. Um, I think I was just uh, lazy when I wrote unit there. It's like it went on. So the the on every iteration, if we have a cache hit, we just print it out. If we do find some work, then we will call compile unit on that work. And uh, I'm I'm starting to see that maybe this should be unit like compile instead of the other way around. Uh, but whatever result we get, we push into the artifacts. So this loop, right, is populating the artifacts vector with stuff that actually got created. Um, so then we can check if there is um, if the artifacts factory is not empty, then we can print out saying, oh, we you know worked on this many artifacts in this many milliseconds. And that's where we use the zero. That's the only reason we have that there. And then we just return the list of artifacts. Um, yeah. This is it's a very ML-ish language for, for something A so low level and B uh, so incredibly fast and mutable when you need it to dirty, if you want to call it that. But yeah, this uh, execution, as you can see, is just a, a breadth first iteration over the tree, right? And the actual work happens inside of this compilation units. Um, so before we get into compilation unit, let's very quickly go through the diffing. The diffing is what takes the tree and turns it into a tree that may or may not have cache hits, right? Um, so if you can, oh, I guess this thing is gonna, I did something to my Vim configuration and now I'm getting automatic folds and I am not a fan of them whatsoever. Yeah. 
Is that fold enable or fold enable? <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I, I agree with you. Yes, <laughs> I think it is. Uh, anyways, well, when we compute a diff, we're essentially grabbing the tree and doing a map over the tree. And again, remember this was a, a map that stops if we return the same uh, node, right? So it doesn't actually go through everything. It doesn't run this function on every node. It will stop at the point where a parent, right, is the same as the, the parent, the updated parent. Um, which is convenient for us because some of these things, you know, will will return the same parent sometimes. But there's an implicit API that I would like to make a little more clear there. Uh, anyways, so we grab every compilation unit and we sort of match it with the different kinds of things that we can do. And I'll just on the side open the compilation unit in build rules. These are the ones that we had available. Cache heat, copy, compile, template, and create there at the beginning. If it's a create directory, then we're essentially putting together uh, the unit again. And we, this can probably be done differently, um, but this is only so we can return the exact same thing at the end or use it in the cache. Yes. Oh. Okay, so then we need to fix that. Uh, where is it? OBS is here. I do have audio capture. Could you speak? Properties. Maybe I need to add another capturing device. Audio um, output capture. Let's see that. Create a new one. Yeah, sorry about this. You probably won't be able to to see any of the settings I'm tweaking right now. Could you speak? Yes. Uh, I don't know if you can hear or not. Okay. I could unmute, but it would be a lot of echo. Okay, I can hear myself in the stream now. Perfect. So apparently, um, I changed something. Cool. I don't know. But there's this uh, source that's called audio capture device, which is the one we used for the last one, and that worked fine. But now I had to add an audio op output capture. Mm. Um, yeah. Computers. Maybe, I don't know, computers. Maybe we didn't, uh, we were not being streamed. <laughs> no, no, we did, we did. I double checked, I double checked. Uh, cool. so I watched the entire thing right before the Rust language retweeted that the video was up. I had finished and I was like, oh, thank God I watched because it could have been a horrible <laughs> live stream, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, thanks, uh, Faru KJ, by the way, for, for mentioning it. Yes. Can Google we give him something? It. Give the sub now. I cannot cheer on my own channel. All right, I'm gonna put a sir sword. I guess that works. Ta -da! Thank you. I don't really know how to stream. <laughs> I feel so old doing these things, you know? It's like, oh, here's a token of appreciation and there's some sword or something. But I grew up with RPGs. Anyways, uh, if we have a create directory, right, then we sort of deconstruct it and take the path, and we're just going to try to canonicalize the path and check if that's okay. So mm -hmm. this is a little confusing. Why would you, like, just canonicalize and check if it's okay? Um, and the reason is that... Oh, we, we got Markdown highlighting here now. Uh, this actually does a side effect. This goes to disk and tries to read this path. I'm just reading the... the so are we, yes. Same so it's, here. It is a strange name, I have to say. Yeah, I agree. But um, it has the property, and I'm going to close this, um, that if you put the path like this, right? Oh, no, okay, then it makes sense. It I turns it into hello. I understand what I did. Okay, that actually makes some sense. Uh, sorry, so it turns it into like helper. full path something hello. 
Yeah. So I like, but it's a helper that makes your path good, I guess. Like, exactly, and checks yeah. if it already exists, which is the important yeah. part here, right? Because if it already exists, then that means that we're going to get an OK back. And then that means we can just cache this. So we return the cached unit. Else, we return the regular unit. And I guess at this point, you would think we could do something like that, right? Do not have to recreate this thing over and over. But um, I can't remember why it didn't compile back then. I probably did something wrong. Um, let's go through the whole compute diff. And then if you want, we can we can try to apply this uh, syntax and see what so happens. So I wonder if there's some combination of syntax when you're using the at with like uh, having it as a mutable reference. Oh, or yeah. Or, yeah so, uh, uh, you're right. That's why we can't do this. Because if you do this, then you get two variables that are pointing to the same memory. Right. So it's about the... Um... It's not the borrow checker, something like that. I guess like, uh, I guess that would be the borrow checker. That would be the borrow. It's checker. just everything the borrow checker. Yes. Yeah, but it sounds <laughs> like uh, you just see Rust and you say, "Oh, it's because of the borrow checker." Yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's like event loop yeah. in JavaScript. What's the exactly. problem? Event like, loop. It's probably yeah. an event loop. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. DNS. Mm. So I'm gonna try the something. The thing I don't understood. No, you said that this map, like, returns early. Oh yeah, yeah. We implemented that map or uh, walked through it uh, on the last stream, where is it here, right? Where? Ah, uh, okay, right. So it's a fake map. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's, I agree your, with it's you. your map. It's, I agree. it's not the the map as the. It is yeah. a proper functor. It's yeah, it's a, a proper functor, functor yes. or something like yes. that. It type it's checks. It type checks. Yes. Yeah. It type checks. Exactly. It is a, it's called map. It's just a yeah. kind of map. Yeah. There's many maps out there. Yeah. Anyways, uh, the copy operation is also very similar. We do the same sort of boilerplate thing where we create a new unit in case we have to, I mean, we need to return one anyways, right? Either by itself or inside of a cache hit box. And so, uh, uh, sorry for the question. I don't mean to be kind of like, uh, like uh, trying to, to <laughs> no, no, to, to or just ask you okay, okay, But yes. I have, I have a suspicion here. If we're actually cloning these references all the time, yes. Like, does this mean that they are not garbage collected? Uh, like, well, the I are, mean they are not because it doesn't. But, but there isn't. Like, yes. So they will be deallocated, right? Manually deallocated at some point. And that point will be when, in this case, whenever this scope um, finishes. The program is done. Exactly. So, in, well, not necessarily the program is done, right? So, this unit, <laughs> that would be pretty bad. Thank God the program runs really, really fast. But <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was my feeling. It's like, yeah, um, who cares? So it's just like more and more memory. Uh, to be fully honest, yeah. I haven't actually checked the memory usage of the library load server after keeping it running for a while. I should, there may be some memory leaks here. I hope there aren't. My but, intuition but like, is that once this unit runs out of, like goes out of scope, then the drop trade will be called and the memory will be deallocated, right? And but because- that garbage collection? Or what am I missing? I like, guess you could call it garbage collection, but- or, or like, uh, since garbage collection isn't my like strongest uh, uh, thing here, but that, that really sounds like because that's not the idea with Rust and uh, the yeah. small level languages if you have to manage memory yourself is that you, the computer doesn't do anything for you. Right, like in C, right, when you have uh, malloc and free, you're allocating and deallocating memory. If you yeah. do this consistently and you have, a, I guess, a, some sort of routine that takes care of giving you memory and checking if the memory is being used and freeing it, then I guess you could say you have a garbage collector of sorts. Here, it just happens to be that the program will, the compiler will automatically add a free every time it knows, okay, this particular piece of memory is no longer being used. Immediately afterwards, isn't that garbage, free. like what you yeah. describe when you use a malloc or free, that's the opposite of a garbage collection. Then you're, you're, you're the garbage man or the garbage person. But so to as say. a garbage person, you are collecting the garbage. <laughs> yes, but like... <laughs> okay, we're stretching the metaphor too far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but what, what, I'm, what, I'm saying, what I'm saying is in garbage collected, 
yeah. languages, there's like uh, specific rooms defined that automatically collects the memory, frees the memory for yeah. you. Whereas in C, you have to use free yourself. Yes. That's the difference between garbage right. collection. And then garbage. under that definition you just gave to us, then Rust will be garbage collected. Because there's a specific rule that you follow, or that you don't follow, but the program follows to free the memory. It just happens to be okay. done at compile time rather than at, at runtime. Um, because that's, that's what I thought when we were going through the code. Like, I don't see anything related to like memory or uh, we, we see that what we're seeing is uh, handling of references and borrowing and like yes. pointing to the same thing with two variables. But, but I haven't seen anything like, okay, free it is now. <laughs> yeah. Those things, which I expected. But right. The, it, you can do those things yourself, as far as I understand, but the drop trait is implemented for pretty much everything. And this makes sure that that free call gets inserted automatically whenever some okay. something goes out of scope. Okay, that makes sense. So what you're saying, like to see if I understood why that is different from a garbage collector, is that in a garbage collector the language you have a process in runtime that will find memory that has no references to it. Yeah. And the yeah remove the allocation. But in this case, you just have data structures that have a drop interface that if implemented will automatically sorry provides a mechanism to remove that allocation and the compiler is able to identify points at which it can inject a call to that drop so there is a sort of macro in the compiler that says hey here there is like the reference is gone call drop if you can exactly i guess that okay. that macro that you're mentioning would be the the semantics of the language. Right, but it is like the compiler injecting it yes. into the yeah. binary. It's not a, it's not a, you know. Yeah, it, a, it might a even, it might even be runtime. like a, like a, I, I don't really know how it's implemented under the hood, but it doesn't have to be the compiler injecting into the binary. It might just be the compiler expanding this into the source, for example. Yeah, the, the, that's actually what I imagined. Like uh, the, this the AST for this builds into some extra elaborated AST that does have the proper calls in there. Right. Yeah. Cool. OK, interesting. Thank you. So you know, compilation unit copy just gets the input and output. And we're using this function called mstat that I'll describe now to check which one is newer. So what mstat is doing is just grabbing the metadata and checking the, the you know, the modify timestamp of a file. and uh, in, in, I guess, Unix the operating systems, this is called the mstat of a file descriptor. But of course, the Rust standard library has nicer names for that. Um, if if we can get the metadata of some metadata of some path, so we have this uh, if okay uh, pattern matching there, then we get the modified timestamp, and we just unwrap that so we get some system time. And um, I mean, we're expecting this to not fail. I could also use the unwrap or else syntax and just put a, um, a function here that just panics in case that we do fail. If we can't find the file, then we just assume the file you know, has end time of epoch. So it's going to be really old. And then that means when you compare against it, then that file will be outdated. Um, again, this is, I guess, the high quiche part of because we're using this mstat libra uh, library function everywhere to determine whether the input is newer than the output. But this is how we're doing the caching here. If the input, right? All right. That's not the short bind. That's yes and less than equal. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is that better? <laughs> there you go. Um, right. Yeah. Yes. So if the input is uh, larger or equal to the output, right? And um, why equals? Because if you modify the input, right, and the output is the exact same timestamp, then that means that your machine is incredibly powerful and <laughs> run it so fast, or that you modify it immediately after a second, like a first modification that yielded the output. So let's say it takes like one second to, to get the output, right? If you modify your input at time uh, zero and you compile, then the output will have timestamp one. And in between that, if you save your input and they have timestamp one both, then that means the output is out of date. Um, yeah, so then we just return a unit, which means we'll do this work. 
Otherwise, we'll just say, yeah, this is good. We catch it. There's probably better ways of doing this caching here, not just based on MSTAT. It would be interesting to implement this with um, essentially sort of like a like a, a like a Merkle tree on disk. So you hash the input and you check if in the folder of output there is another there is a file that has the hash of the input and that will be the output and so on. So then you can rely on the contents, not on the timestamps. Uh, you could mess this up, right? If you modify, if you touch the output file, then recompiling should actually uh, cache it, even though it has to be redone. So there's a couple of limitations this has. Compilation, very, very similar. Right now, like the only thing we're doing is the diffing, right? We're trying to see if we need to redo work. We're not doing any work here. Templating, same thing, except that we check that the input has to be uh, newer than the output, right? And the template has to be newer than the output. And if we have a catch hit, then we just ignore it. Just keeps going on. Uh, yeah, so that's how we go from a tree of stuff that we think we need to do to a tree of stuff that we know we have to do. Pretty, I'd say it's, you know, pretty straightforward. I mean, it is, but it's just so elegant. I mean, there's not too much to add or the fact that no, but uh, seriously, because uh, the problem that you have is that otherwise you, you would have what? A script that is uh, traversing the directories and then building right away, right? Yeah. And that's, that's so dangerous. Like, uh, I've seen some build tools that operate, like, one step at a time. Yeah. They are so superior to tools that are halfway. Mm. Because then if you have an, an abort, an unexpected abort, then you don't have a way to roll back. Yeah. Like you don't know what step it was and how, what to roll, roll back to. Like you might have transitionary state. That exactly. You're screwed. So yeah, it's important that you build this tree and execute on it. Something that I've thought to do was um, to actually cache this um, uh, output in, in some, somewhere like hot stuff. And then this would be like hash of tree, right? And then this will be the output. So this will be the actual files and the artifacts. And only after you know this is done successfully, then in the local folder, you can update this uh, output link to the new temp directory. Uh, this is the way Basil does it. Right. And that essentially means, you know, you, you cannot fuck up your current you know, artifacts. There's yeah. just no way. I mean, yeah. I guess there's always a way, but um, it would be much, much harder. I mean, that, that it sounds, to be honest, sounds maybe a bit overkill for your yeah. scope here. Yes. Like it feels like uh, it needs to be more mission critical for that. It makes sense if Basil yeah. does it. Yeah, but exactly. Yeah, that, that could be a kind of the more atomic even way. Like you do the whole yeah. thing and then you have a replacement step. I think it would be nice if you were doing a lot of very big changes, right? To be able to go back and forth the different ar artifacts. Yeah. Like if the compilation was more let's say, smarter than it is right now. If you're mm -hmm. working with something other than just markdown files like it turned into HTML, then yeah. maybe you want to try a couple of like input changes to see how the compiler optimizes that. And then it would yeah. be nice to have the different compilation outputs hashed so you can compare and see like, oh, this change actually, you know, uh, corresponds to this optimization and it didn't do what I thought it was going to do. But, you know, I'm not doing any of that. So it's not... Oh. So like all this deal. hashing thing and saving all artifacts and stuff, it really reminds me of Nix, how Nix works, because everything's like you're, you're but you know, I mean, you're never building the packages yourself. You, uh, you just download them and they're saved uh, in a, like your Nix store with a global hash and you're, uh, everything's simbling into your directory where you're using it. And, uh, and you can like step back generations. Like I manage my whole home, uh, home directory with a Nix, Nix thing. Uh, so I can basically just go through all my like every, every home uh, home uh, I have for my user is basically an artifact with all my installations like NeoVim, the color schemes, uh, Rust up, Node.js, and everything. And that's I can as an artifact. So I can basically go through my generation, step back, like oh let's go back to Tuesday, and then have my home directory from Tuesday. 
Yeah. That was pretty neat. Actually, like yeah. if you if you if that sounds interesting to you, we can talk later, but I think it could be neat to do a stream like if you want to walk through that later on. Because I'm super curious. Yeah. I tried Nix a while ago. Uh, I think that the only reason I couldn't go full in was because I didn't know how to install certain things that mm -hmm. I had to go back to brew. But I yeah. feel like it was kind of a I didn't try yeah, good enough. Yeah, so it yeah. I'm still using Brew as well for some things because not everything is on Nix because someone needs to build it on Nix and put it up there. Just like Brew, and Brew is so much bigger than Nix and tailored for Mac, whereas Nix is, uh, I guess, mainly for Nix OS, but you can use it on everything that basically, it's dumb to say a Nix compatible yeah. <laughs> OS when you're installing Nix, but you know, a star Nix like uh, Mac OS and Ubuntu and everything. So, as uh, earlier today, there was uh, someone talking about Nix and how it's fantastic. And uh, yeah, I realized, immediately realized like every day I do something in Ubuntu, or is that day I'm closer to starting a new with Nix because that is the future. Like, that's where we're going. There's no way that we're going to be stuck in the, well, there is a way that we will be stuck in the world we're in right now when we have something so much better right there. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, we were joking with Pontus that maybe we'll do a live stream of that, but then I have to use my phone because I'm going to restart the entire operating system. So. <laughs> That's why you just need to machines get a, exist. To yeah. yeah, I know, I know. You but get you know, a streaming PC. Yeah, yeah, I should get a separate. I, I guess I could use a laptop, you know, like stream with a laptop and restart everything. But I'm going to need a long weekend because I work with this. Uh, so I, I don't yeah, really but, have. Um, yeah, anyways. No, but the, just just uh, you want to at some point walking through your setup or something like that. That would be super interesting. Yeah. But uh, we can do another time. Yes. Um, yeah, well, so that's the execution and diffing of the graph. It's uh, pretty straightforward, just going through a tree. And we are done. You will notice, however, that the execute function, right, does return the list of artifacts. And keep this in mind because it will come back. The one thing that we need to talk about, though, is how we're actually compiling these things. Like, we have this compilation unit, so we need to execute them somehow, right? Um, and we have this compile unit function that is already highlighted on the right side of the screen. And yeah, so I'm going to close this. This one over here is the one that actually does the work. So this is essentially another, um, I guess, you know, the transformation between the compilation units. But instead of figuring out whether you cache or not, it actually does the work. If you've got a cache hit, it does nothing. If you have to create a directory, then it actually calls create the all to create the directory. It copies the file for copy. If you have a compilation unit, right? And this thing is, um, yeah, it checks the extension. If it's markdown, then it calls the Comrack uh, markdown compiler and it compiles that to HTML and you get the string back and then you copy that to the output file. If it's a template, then you read the input, right? Um, you build up the, um, an HTML uh, tree out of that input. You do the templating here, and it's become a little more complex than before. Now we're extracting the first heading and using that as the title, if you have that. That's the only difference. And then, of course, you read the template in the meantime. And then you, you know, write down the, the templated file to disk. So, if Seriously, like if you are going to build something that can be layered like this as, you know, a tree where you apply different transformations, it makes it so much easier to reason about the work that you're doing. You know, we have one compilation unit. We need to execute it. It's this. It's this one function that does the whole work. If you want it, this could be individual smaller functions, right? The, the template could actually have inside another struct that is like template uh, action, for example, right? which means you could have one function that does just this thing, just grab the template action, that's the input, and it does something. And then, you know, you have all of these tiny bits of code that get mushed together in this tree that you transform, and it's just so beautiful. But uh, so that's the end. To, but uh, to understand, uh, to understand if, if my intuition is correct, this is the only file, or like, sorry, the only function that you have that is fully effectful. 
Yeah, the yeah the main. Like, yes. What I what I mean by that is yes, that yes. it has you know a persistent effect. Side effect. Yes, exactly. It, it's not just I or reading. Exactly, the diffing function does some reading, right? But that's right. it. Um, yeah, the, that's fairly safe. Yes, the compi that's compile I unit does the thing. The mstat is actually like a side effect that actually reads the files, but it doesn't really do anything. But it's a like a side effect, like you're accessing yes. the files on this. Uh, absolutely. Package. That that is why I was doing air quotes because it is definitely effectful. I just mean that the other, the last one is the only one that you would have to. If you want to do a dry run, you would probably disable the last one. But then it's as simple as changing it by something that has the same API, really, like it does the same like signature, right? Yes. And then you can have a dry run function that tells you, oh, this is the task that I could have done. Ex one hundred percent exactly. So if, or if you want another target, like a network target instead of that. Yes, yes, 100%, yes. Uh, so that's something that uh, um, when you think about how Basil works, makes perfect sense. Because you can use Basil to uh, compile against remote targets, against remote caches, right? So if the three of us were working on a massive project, say in Java, right? That Java and C++ is what Basil works most uh, most well integrated with. Um, and then I compile something, and because I put my stuff in that cache, then your diffing function is going to go to that cache to see if there's something that has changed there instead of rebuilding it locally, and just going to pull the artifacts if it has to, right? So then all of a sudden, because we have this logic separated, we can go from build locally to you know, builds together. And I think that's very powerful. <laughs> yes. Uh, is Basil developed by Google? Yes. Yeah. Just Used to be called Blaze. Company that has big artifacts to build that uses C++ and Java. <laughs> I guess I probably use it with Go as well, right? Yeah. There's a, there's a couple of those. Uh, considering they have a single repository for everything you want incremental builds. Yeah. yeah. But anyways, that's sort of the end of the compilation part of it. The result you know, of this thing will be the artifact. And if you go one level back, then execute will get the list of artifacts. And if you go one level back to the main, right, then you're ignoring the artifacts here and just logging out the, um, the time it took. Awesome. Can go now into the server. Um, the server follows the same pattern. There's a struct for the options, and it has a serve function. It puts together a project. The first thing it does is it's um, it's you know doing a, a build of the entire project, or at least what needs to be built, right? So that by the time it serves you the the URL, then you already have everything built, and then you can go. And because this takes like you know two milliseconds, then it's it's really fast. And um, yeah, then it starts a server from a project because we need to have some of this data available, like what's the root of the project and what the output directory will be. A port to listen on. The output and the root, those were specified in the uh, yeah, S expression file, right? Uh, no, in, the, that in this case, these are uh, input parameters, right? Oh, okay. To the command line. Okay. So you call this. Oh thing... right, we're talking about the server. Sorry, uh, yeah, I mixed it up with the actual. Uh... By default, uh, you serve and you know, serve from the current folder. Dot. Sorry. Hmm. I forget. Yeah, you serve serve from the root, and you build to the output. Um, which is kind of weird now that I think of it. Yeah, I don't. I no longer know how this works. <laughs> uh, anyways, let's let's step into the server and we'll quickly get there. Are you not writing self document documented code, like clean code and stuff? Did I write this? Yes, I said. Uh, all right. So the server is just a struct and implements uh, from project uh, constructor, right? That by default picks a port for thousand. So we also update the port with whatever you put in the, in the command line. And it has this listen function, and that's sort of the end of the server. 
Um, I haven't really structured the rest of this module in a very rusty way, I'd say, and prepare to get into the mess that is to, to build um, the connection handlers. But listening essentially clones the project because we need to clone a couple of things. And yes, there's a good chance that we can get rid of some of these clones. And by the way, if uh, Vega is watching, I have run Clippy. There is a commit in the repo where I get rid of a bunch of clones and stuff. And I have not noticed it being faster, but I reckon that I am not doing that much work anyways. <laughs> so it should be okay. Um, we bind to the, the loopback directory, sorry, uh, directory, um, address on the port, and then we just start this hyper server on that address. Um, it does offer... Hyper is a web, web server for Rust, right? Yes. Yes. It's a fast and correct HTTP implementation written in and for Rust. It's not even blazing fast. It's just fast. Yeah, yeah. but it's, it's like... like Star, star, fast, star, star. Uh, yeah. Yes. And also, correct. I don't know, it's, it's pretty fast. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I just assume that everything's, everything in Rust is fast. I know that's not the case, but I think it's pretty good. I assume it's a pretty good language to write things that are fast. I'm surprised promises are fast after I saw that talk about optimizing algebraic data structures. And at some point, it appeared that when you do a promise, you actually are building this, um, you know, type for the specific promise, parameterized for the values that you want. And it sort of expands, it's a state machine that expands depending on how many nested promises you have. Um, I, it's still beyond my understanding of the language, how easy that that works. Are, are we talking about, I think, uh, I'm thinking about, I think it's called monomorphization. When you have generic types in a programming language, and yeah. the compiler actually have to create a type for, when, basically, when you comp compile the program, like for every T, if T is the generic type, uh, we actually have yeah. to compile it down to the actual actual T yeah. in so the program. So when you say option so can... of int, actually turns so, into option int, like that will so be the name of the type. Treating yeah, the exactly. Oh, we have an option. It's treating but if you need to find if, if you if you define your own generic function that takes a, a u or a t, yeah. No, this, this doesn't have. This, this is not types. about monomorphization, though. This is about lifting the code that you have in a in a particular you know promise into a data structure. Okay. Oh, okay, so they have specific data structure for the promises. In yes. again, don't take my word as authoritative for it. That's what I got from that talk. Uh, I need to double check what I'm saying, though. Uh, you want to say something, Fernando? No, no, no. It was just, uh, uh, if I was understanding correctly, that monomorphization essentially treats the generics as if they were uh, C++ templates. So, you know, they're not really generics anymore. It's just uh, templates, but the uh, compiler treats the generics. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's templating it code, yes. To, it lies to you telling that they are generics, but more. Yes. My guess is that they're both, uh, but the compiler seems to do a lot of monomorph. I think it monomorphizes everything it can. And that might be one of the reasons it's slow. Like it has to do a lot of a lot of work. But okay. anyway, so we have this bind uh, this uh, serp function, right? That we can use to pass in a particular function that will take care of dealing with a connection. Um, as it turns out, the hyper server provides you two helper functions, make service function and service function, uh, very, very uh, descriptively named, that you can use to sort of put together your own request handler. So I'm going to skip through, hand wave through the magic of this all the way till here, right? And the rest of, you know, the closing. <laughs> But essentially, you have to return a future or an async block. I'm not sure if I can call this thing a future. Um, that will resolve to an OK value where the, the thing it wraps, right, is a service function. Yeah, I, don't, I can't speak much to it. But inside of this service function, you will get your own request, right? 
and you can deal with that request and do stuff. And this is where you know the, the code I wrote actually begins. The rest, all of these two lines and this thing over here, it's boilerplate from the library. Let's see if there's any documentation about that. Yeah, this creates a service from a function. You can see the example they have there. Yeah. All right. I'll go to our routing function after I finish going through this. So we set up the server, right? And we sort of log out to Sinfo. We're going to be listening here. And that's just because I like to, I have, you know, because I am in um, Kitty, I have this command where I can just look through links on a page on whatever I have on screen. And if I press one, it will open that on a browser for me. You can't see that, but it opened on the other, other screen over here. I'll close that. And then uh, we just sort of wait on the server. And if at some point the server returns, it will be with an error, and then we die. Error. Otherwise, it will just wait. All right. Yes. So this infallible type, as far as I understood, uh, this is essentially uh, your, you know, void. Not your C style void, but your Haskell style void. There are no values of the infallible type. So this is. Yeah, I agree. It took me a while to understand what exactly this was. Assuming I do. Yes. So it's a never. Yeah. Yes. But it's a never explicitly for type for errors. That, I, I mean, it is so that there is a, a never, like a special never, right? It looks like for future compatibility, there is this never type, which is like bang. It's an overloading of the syntax bang. But this is in unstable. Okay. But I don't understand the syntax of the OK. Is that the result? Type. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, the parameters of the result type. So this will be the same as saying uh, let res, and this will be like result, and then something infallible. OK, and then the service function there. Okay. And of course, returning the thing afterwards. Uh, so this, um, this thing, which is um, called the no. turbo fish, that just allows you to parameterize the type of the constructor that you have on the left. Yeah. And they, they said that you should use infallible type if you're sure that this can never fail. What's yes. that like? Because if, it, if it's the infallible type, it can't match on it since it has no constructor. Yeah, no variance, exactly. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, uh, like the compiler that won't scream at you for not matching it. Yes. Or is that OK? I mean, my code is perfect. I've never written any bug in my life, so I'll use this type. Yes. Uh, our routing function, it's an async function, so it returns a promise. And we're doing some very, very grotesque routing here, where we grab the path in query, and we just unwrap that and get the path and check if it starts with this. And this really should be uh, reload. Uh, but um, I'm not going to change it now. And if we are in the reload path, and this is a special path that we'll see in a second, then we go into the wait for changes. Uh, otherwise, we serve a file. Now, because this is a promise or a future, then the runtime can sort of schedule it in and out. So we're not really blocking, even though we do wait for changes. And then we'll see that in a second. Let's quickly cover the serving. So one question. Yes. Uh, at uh, the previous uh, stream, we talked about the async and we're using Tokyo. Are we using that here as well? Or are we using uh, the standard async or are we using anything else? We're using the standard async for everything except the runtime. For the runtime, we're using Tokyo. Oh. Ah, OK. And yeah, so that means that there should be almost no mention of Tokyo anywhere in here, maybe the delay. Yeah, and the yielding. But these are the two only uh, mentions of it. 
not good. Okay. So if we are reloading, then we go into this route, else we go to serve file. Um, there are web frameworks for Rust. Rust is mostly web yet. If you go to rewebyet.com, I think, then you'll see the website that says, oh, we have all this infrastructure. I should probably put the link somewhere. Are we web yet? We need to check the chat more often. But uh, there was a question about whether there is an infallible type in reason slash OCaml as well. And I do not know if there is a void type in OCaml. Well, uh, you can make uh, abstract types, right? That exist but have no values. So you can make your own infallible uh, type like this in OCaml. And then you can't really create a value of it, and that will be the same. Yeah, good point. I mean, it is a bit confusing, but the idea really is that it's a type without any definitions. You cannot construct any value of that type. That's all. It Ex is exactly. Like if I look at here, like the for example the path buff, you'll see that okay, this doesn't actually show me the definition. Uh, maybe result. Also does. Was it called infallible in OCaml as well? I don't, I think, don't um, think it's called infallible. Uh, yeah. I think this is a Rust name. I think in every other language is either called never or void. Yeah, void, never, uh, maybe like impossible or impossible, empty yeah. or I guess uh, yeah. bottom. Contradiction, no, I, top. like in some cases. In, yeah, contradiction. Uh, so to like to the comparison with the unit, uh, unit has exactly one. Exactly, this is a type with yeah. zero values. Yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. I guess it will make sense to call it zero. Yeah, I mean from the um, like type uh, algebra perspective, it's the zero type. Yeah, like it's, it's the one with. No. It's the empty uh, and the empty set, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, precisely. I think. I think. Uh, Bartos Milevsky defines a function called absurd that takes an void that creates an A. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It. So oh, it's absurd. absurd. You know what? It's, it's, it's actual... called it's called false. False. Yes. In some language? In what no, language? like in, in logic. Is, is that like logic? Like uh, you can't prove if, something if you, that's false. If you can ever... if you can prove false, you can prove anything, right? Yeah, but uh, now you're talking yeah. Yeah, but this is slightly different, right? Like that is if you take the type system as a whole, as a as a theorem prover. But uh, like because you usually call false uh, the a, a, a positive a value in yeah, but usually you call false an actual value in Boolean algebra. Right, right, um, not the type. Yeah, not the type of like I cannot even compute this. Exactly. And, but the, going back to like uh, you said something interesting. Oh, about absurd. That's an actual function in Haskell. It's not just Milesk. Yeah. There oh, is a wait. data void package so that's absurd. We're getting we're getting a data, comment. The functor, the functor f from f of void to f of a, and then there's also a monad with void from uh, m of void to m of a. <laughs> I don't know why you would when or why you would use it, but. Uh... So Faru so could... G is saying that you could construct a type A if you pass that module as a functor. Type A being that uh, the fake type that you were building. Yeah, but how could you construct a type if the definition of the type says that it is empty? I mean, this is a, has to be a no camel specific thing. So I don't know how you can use a module as a fact as a functor in OCaml. I, I know you told me that uh, that's uh, how you do kind of type classes in OCaml. Right. I, yeah. I don't know what the mechanism looks like. I I can't really see how that works. If I were KG, if you can uh, if you can figure out how to do that, like if you have a tiny snippet of code that you could throw in and run doing on it and see that working, that would be fantastic. I would love to be proven wrong, but. Um, mm. That's yeah. ex falso quid libet, whatever it says. That's that's the uh, the text for the absurd function in Haskell. Since void values logically don't logic logically don't exist, the witness of the logical reasoning tool of ex falso. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Libet. Yeah. Yeah, but that means it's an absurd. If you can prove that, then you can prove anything. Yeah. 
And if you're talking set theory, it's like the empty set. So it basically, I'm, I'm telling you to look into the empty set and count the, the inhabitants. And there are no inhabitants, so it's impossible to count it, I guess. All right. Yep. I think that's the... This is the serve file function. <laughs> we we do like our v tours into type theory, yes, right? Yes. And like isomorphisms, yeah. isomorphisms between types and logic. Uh, yeah, and this this is a uh, this is a pretty straightforward function as well, where we're only trying to get the contents of the file so we can reply, you know, to the browser. So we try to get a path with a fallback from the root using the request. And then we'll try to read that file and we'll try to get the extension to that file. And because not all files have extensions, then we need to cover our assets for that with an empty could you, string. Uh, could you pass an immutable reference to the read instead of cloning the path? Or is read like... Possible. Po that's very I mean, possible. I just assume that we only need to like uh, know the actual path and then like, uh, okay, this is what I'm reading. So if this compiles, then you're right. I think it will compile. It did. Look at that. Brajovat. Nice. The rusty count. Uh, yes. Is, it, is that how you call it? Rusters? A rustation? Rustation, <laughs> not rusty count. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. When we get a file, either we read it successfully, so it's an OK with contents, and we figure out how to get the body and put the body in a response. If there's an error, then we actually return not found. And we just start printing, you know, serving this file path. And we sort of unwrap that's, the response. And status code, is that's that's a thing from Hyper. So it's basically a 404 or... Uh, yeah, in this case, this will be a not found 404. You can also turn it back into a U16 or from a U16. Um, with one exception, 418, I'm a T-Bot. It's missing 420 also. <laughs> it's the same. Inexplicably not in the register. Uh, yeah, when we do get a body, we check the extension. And if we're expecting some HTML, then we'll, we'll inject the browser reloader script into it by reading the contents into a UTF-8 string. So right now here, this is uh, essentially a vector, I think. Can I see the type of this? Read. Yeah, we get a vector of, of bytes, essentially. So this is not really a string that we can print nicely and whatnot. But as Sorry, we... Is... Sorry, it's not a buffer. No, no, no. No, OK. No, we're, not, we're doing unbuffered uh, reads here. Okay. I mean, I, it's kind of pointless to make it a buffer, yeah. but I was surprised it's not the default. If we were serving content to people with this, then yeah, we should probably add buffer buffering, right? And the stream the content back into the client. But since this is local, I thought, yeah, I don't, I don't care. Read everything into memory, dump it out. So we are building up the UTF-8 string from this contents, right? We're using the include string macro to include a file from our sources, and we'll get to that in a second. We're uh, using the, um, yes, this source is just a string that we're using to build a DOM element we're using this document from. And this comes from a library above here called uh, Nipper. And Nipper is an HTML manipulation with CSS selector library, which is pretty handy. And it builds on top of a couple of libraries that are part of the Mozilla servo engine. If I understood it that correctly. It feels like they lost the opportunity to call it jQuery for Rust. Yeah. Our query or something like Our that. Anyways, we build that thing and then we build the actual uh, document, right, from the contents that we read here. To be honest, this will be a little cleaner if it was like that. Build that thing, build this thing. And then uh, we select the body and we append some HTML, which comes from the reloader. So we're appending this new tag, right? That will be the reloading script. And then we grab the HTML, get the content as HTML, right? Uh, get the bytes, turn the bytes into a vector. And then we have the same type that we had before, uh, which is what we need in case that you are not giving us an HTML file. 
and that's what sort of ends up into the the body of the response so as you can see this is pretty straightforward figure out what file to serve read it if it's html then do a little bit of magic to inject the reloading script in there otherwise just forward that content straight into the response Yeah, so this include string will bring the reloader script, which I guess is about time we open. And this is the JavaScript I wrote for this project. I am so proud of it. All right. So we have this huge banner that's awesome that appears the moment you load the page. And then we sort of get two queries. We're going to get everything that has a source on an href in the page and we put it putting that in the list and we're going to reduce that list into an object where the object has the href value right or the source value depending which one we're using as the key and the actual dom element as the value so that means that if you imported a file called hello css then the object will have this thing and then we have a dom element there right and this will be the actual href value. So if you use something like, I don't know, uh, unpackage.com, what, right? Or if it was a relative path, right? Like that. Then this will be where we actually got the CSS from. This will be the DOM element that currently has it. And that's our assets uh, object after we build it. The one exemption we make is for the actual page that you were in, where we use the location. And if the location is just a slash, then we use index HTML. If you do have a file name like my doc, right, then we use that instead. And for that particular element of the object, we're going to use a symbol, right, for the keyword reload. If this changes, if this path changes, then we need to reload the page. And this is sort of how we're going to differentiate what to do with the change after we get the changes back. Um, you like your symbols, I know that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> we logged that we're listening on changes. We have this tiny function, recursively um, makes a request to hot stuff reload and wait for it. And when it comes back, we get some JSON and it gets a list of changes. And for each one of the changes, we grab the path. It's a little messy, but let me try to unpack it. We'll put together a name based on the current location of the uh, host and the path that we got from the server. And we'll try to use that name to check in the assets folder, whether it exists or not. If it does exist, then we get that. If it's nil, uh, sorry, null or undefined, then we just use false. If, um, if asset path, not asset name, happens to be the symbol reload, that means that we've arrived to the case in line 21 to 23. So we, you, you have changed or we received from the server a change that includes a line like index.html. So we need to actually reload the current page. Uh, we don't care about other pages. If you change any other page, we don't need to reload. We only reload on the current page. That's here. However, if... Um, if there's any other change, right, then we will try to uh, actually uh, reload that file by pick, figuring out what attribute we need to pick. So if the element source, right, then we use source. If it's not set or is undefined, then we use href. We'll grab the last value, we'll set the current value to empty, and we'll set the current value to the last value. And this is enough for the browser to pick up that it needs to re-download the asset, any asset really. Even if the, even if it is the same file. Yes. Same name, everything. Yes. I'm assuming you are like making sure the server gives doesn't give you a 304. The server all always returns 200. There you go. Yes. Good. <laughs> Pretty dumb. Yes. Like um, fresh here. Have this. Fresh yeah, this file. is a it's new file. Fresh. Yes. Oh, I've never seen you before. Here's this new file. And then after we're done with this, right? For each, then we go into wait for changes again. Um, I am not entirely sure if this is eventually gonna blow up the stack. 
Possibly. But uh, it's not like you're making thousand changes per second anyways. It's, I mean, it's a new promise. It shouldn't because it's a new event loop. This is borrow checker event loop. <laughs> no, but uh, I'm serious. I, I think I, I think I know what I'm talking about here. You All have right. a new event loop when you are like satisfying a promise. So you're not in the same frame. Each time it gets called, it's in a different event loop. All right. So then that means that this is completely safe to do. Yeah, it should be. I mean, I do this all the time. So either my pages are blowing up <laughs> for everybody. Yes. Or... <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I trust you. So, and this hasn't broke, you know, broken, hasn't broken, hasn't been broken on me. It has not... By the way, break um, it. Faru, Faru KJ actually pasted the code for it. Oh, yeah. look at that. I'm being owned. I think I first saw this one. Ha! Oh, am, am I being owned by myself? <laughs> Damn, you bust yourself. Yeah. I think you can extend the type. That's what's happening, right? Uh, so, okay, so I'm going to copy that. I'm going to paste it in a new module. I'm going to take a very quick detour because <laughs> is that this is recent. Uh, recent, pretty print. Oh, yeah, I'm not an SE project. Okay. So I don't have the formatter installed globally. Uh, okay. Oh, yes. So this will be the signature. Yes. Um, yeah. All right. But what, what we're doing here is saying that the signature will have a type, right, that we can construct on the outside. But in the inside, the, act, the type actually is constructible. What I'm trying to say is that if you have a module A, right, not a signature, an actual module A, where you have something like type, you know, uh, impossible, like that, there's no way in hell anybody can ever extend this specific type to, to, to construct values of it. Uh, can you please explain to me what the difference is between line 13 and line 2? 13 and 2. Yes. So this is a module type, which means some modules will have a signature, right? Yeah. Which is the public interface of the module. And they will have a type that is not constructible from the outside. But there is still an inside of the module where you could define it to be something, right? Essentially, I could say uh, that the module A has signature seek, and that means that when you look at this from the outside, A.impossible, the type impossible inside of A, right? It's opaque. So you can't really construct it. But on the inside, this module could say type impossible equals bool, right? and do something with it. So the line two, you're defining the type of a module. You're not defining a module. Exactly. This is the, the signature of the type of a module, yes. And you're saying that all modules that have this type, right, will have a type called T, but will not expose what their T is. It's essentially saying T in modules that have this signature, modules that have this module type, will have an opaque type T. So it may be something inside, we just don't know about it. And that's different than having a type T that it actually is empty. Uh, there's a couple of libraries that do something like this. I think you may have picked this up from LWT, uh, where they do have like a, a resolvable uh, type, or uh, I think they do have a type never that they use to, to as, essentially as a phantom type. Because that's the nice thing about these types. You don't necessarily need to construct values with them, but you can still use them in the type system to constrain some, some things, right? Yeah, I remember when we had a long rabbit hole about using ghost types to add like implicit uh, refining of the type. So you have, I have a string that is actually an URL because the only way to construct this type, which has a ghost type that says URL, it's yes. Really a URL. Yes. Uh, exactly. You added the ghost type in there that you could only instantiate through a valid URL function. Exactly. Yes. So, uh, yeah. It was fun. Yes. Uh, that's a that's a very useful but a very different use case than having a type that cannot be, uh, you know, specified. Yes. Uh, yep. Faru KJ, I, th I think you're a couple of seconds uh, behind us over here. I can read your yeah. comments, but you're still in the past. This is time traveling. 
Uh, but yes, <laughs> we, we definitely have done uh, phantom types, right? Using types that cannot be instantiated, but that we still use in the type signatures. The fact, I mean, so since phantom types are still created, right? Like we can we can say that uh, the only way to to uh, uh, have this phantom type in the program is by calling the uh, parse URL function, and the phantom type will only be added to the to the variable if we successfully parse the URL. Right, so but, the only way but to, it's the very, only way to have that. Yes, that you're completely yeah, that's correct. But the, it's very very important to know that you never actually create a value of that type because there aren't any values of that type, uh, of the phantom type, right? The other type you do get the value of, yes. It's interesting. Apparently, uh, competing uh, a standard library for reason, and Manfaro Kechai was saying, Relude. I googled it, this uh, alternative standard library for reason ML. It uh, apparently is doing using the ghost types. Is it like... Um, marking refinements. What's the name of the organization in, in GitHub? Uh, let me find it. A reason, uh, but with, it's different. <laughs> it's spelled. Uh, let me paste the link. Cool. What? Ah, right. I can't. I'm not logged in 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 there. Um, R E A Z E N. A oh, reason. Like reason. Yeah. It's a. Yeah. Yes. All right. Reload. A You're bump. gonna get some free publicity. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's look at this source. So I guess uh, some of these ones like void, impossible to construct a value. And it has absurdity defined, which is really nice. Here they're talking about the, exactly the same thing that the, yep. uh, the mm -hmm. infallible in Rust, for example, the type result a void t is still a result. You can still do all the normal result things, but you can know the fact that it can't be an error. Yeah. I mean, can't we just do that for everything? That we have no errors in our program and that's shipped it. Yeah. So my guess is that if you actually want to define a, f a value for the function absurd and not just a the type, then you would have to uh, have something that is a T, right? Uh, I don't know how the expose is on the outside. String equals absurd. Uh, it can be used when you need to provide a function from void t to another type because no value of void can be constructed. This function will never actually be called. Okay, and then this is, you, you can't construct it because the only way to put a void is to put another void, which is to put another void, to put another void, and to put another void, and so on. And the absurd, the, the, this absurd, is this just the defined bottom? No, this is the way this type is defined, right? Recursively, t, right? has one constructor void that takes another T inside. I mean, yeah. that's not the standard construction. Of no, the exactly. Void type. Yeah. This is, that's interesting because technically that is the a valid construction of code data. So like you can build a core recursive type that is exactly that, that's a stream. Okay. You know, it has itself inside and that's it. So it doesn't have to be. Uh, this, is, this, is not the, this is not the uh, interface file. So the absurd is a function that just never terminates, right? Yeah, the yeah, absurd will never terminate. Right. So it's bottom. I guess, like, I guess it will be like bottom. bottom. I don't know how Haskell implements bottom inside. Uh, but no, but the, 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 the definition of bottom in Haskell is the fact that like the language is turning complete. So we always have this like, uh, you can write a, a function that type checks, but never uh, finishes. And that's like the, yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing here, like it. This feels like tricks. a hack. Um, that I, might, I mean, that it might sound feels... strong, yeah, but it feels like we needed to like do something that you could never do, uh, or you could never construct to be able to get absurd. Yeah. yeah. But I yeah, so understand, can, right? Call yeah, exactly. I, I understand. You, you can't really construct these values, so you can't really call this function. And if you do manage to construct one of these values, which by the way, you can't, then calling absurd will just break your program. Can you um, like with object magic or something like that? I don't know, I've never used that, but that's like the escape hatch, right? No camel. Yeah, and somewhere in here, we have concat. This is uh, another set of functions that Faro KG is uh, pointing at. Da, 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 da. Oh wait, he said, forget last posts. 
And I'm gonna assume that he meant forget the last uh, thing we're bringing in, like link. Um, Relude, look at that. Doesn't look like Java at all. Uh, nice. Yeah, so this thing you see here, Fernando, this is essentially um, modules within modules, like a functor within a module, right? That's producing a module that we're including, sort of like, exp like splatting, if you want to call it that, or smooshing uh, into this uh, existing like module scope. And that's sort of how you do these type classes. Like you define a semi-group, right? In this case, you're saying the type variables for the semi-group are these ones. And then you call this particular functor that if we go to extensions, semi-group, any, you'll see we have a functor here. And this sort of defines this concat name function that just calls append on whatever you pass in that follows the semi-group interface. Makes sense. Yes. And then prefix and suffix and so on. And you have the infix operator plus there. Hmm. Yeah, interesting to see how they define void. I wonder where do they use it. So, void. IO, I guess in IO they use unit with void, relative void, delayed with void. But I wonder why didn't they just use an empty type? Void. Like you can you're you're gonna be guaranteed that nobody will ever ever construct this because there's no constructor for it. You I mean, don't that... sorry. You can implement absurd, right? Um, but also, do you really need absurd? Can you define a function just as a like type signature without giving it a body in your Um As part of a yeah, signature? Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah, like a type constructor, but no data constructor. I mean, that's usually what you do when you when you're using these. Uh, what do you call them? Uh, okay, so this is what they're using it for. Uh, when you do, when you're using, I mean, you usually do that when you have abstract types in modules, right? You just do type t and then in the type yeah. signature. You know what? I think I'm maybe being naive here. They are using the absurd function for something, right? In some of these lower level functions, I guess. Like on summon error, you get some result, and when you do get a throw, then you just call absurd there, for example. Uh, so there, there might be something to why they're using the void representation they're using, right? Um, now, my worry would be this throw is coming from somewhere that supposedly can never come up with a void. But, you know, as far as I can tell from looking at this line, there's a void. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Um, unless, yeah. Is this a pattern match? Maybe it can pattern match on something else for a throw? No, it doesn't. No, this is a pattern match, like this switch. Yeah. Yeah. Because like I thought the idea was that you couldn't pattern match on it. I mean, you're not pattern matching on the void, right? You're oh, pattern matching yeah, on right. the thing around it. Throw. Yeah. But this will be like the equivalent of having a, like a maybe void. But I, I just assume that the inferred it's type just of void, void there shouldn't <laughs> be able to be passed in into the absurd function. Well, it would because it would be the right type, but who can come up with this, <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't know. There might be some truth to it. We might we might need to sit down with and what was his name, Andy White, just ask him, hey man, why, how does this work? Oh, he has a good point. Faru KJ says that that this might come from JavaScript, and of course, if you're bringing that into the table, then everything can happen. Uh, oh. <laughs> that that makes a lot more sense now. But this this prelude is oriented at the bundle script. Yes. All right. I'll just close that. Good source. Thanks for that. Um, Could we have like a three minute break or something? Yeah, of course. Just re refilling. Uh, you know what I'm gonna do? Camera. I'm gonna run an ad. 
Yeah, <laughs> I don't even know how it works, but the Twitch stream manager has these buttons on the right where it says like, clip that thing, rate a channel, add stream marker, yeah. run 30 second ad break. <laughs> so okay. we're gonna go do that. Fire KG, if you wanna go get some water, this is the time. Uh, should we do 120 or 30 seconds? Pontus, up to you. Huh? 30 seconds, 120 is even. Yeah, go for it. I just disabled my ad locker on your channel. Yeah, yeah. okay, good okay, go, go, go. We're, we're going to the bathroom now. <laughs> 25 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> Damn, 30 seconds goes fast. Goes brr, brr. I, I don't think there was any ad. I have the stream open. Really? I, I, like, can you really have ads I for any know. type of size of video? Probably you need to enable, I mean, YouTube, you need to reach like a thousand subscriptors and I don't know what. I could be surprised if you can run ads like with any level of streaming. Very possible. Uh, I don't understand then. Oh yeah, you saw an ad, good. That works. That ad is gonna go pay for my mortgage. Thank you for that. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so it's my fault for having it then disabled. I'm, I'm in, I should be supporting you, <laughs> Yandra. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, you should, man. You really should. Thank you for that though. I'm just uh, trying to check if we can plug in a link to this thing anywhere else, but no. All right, I guess the Pontus will be here in a second. Yeah. Ta -da. So the weirdest thing happened the other day. I went to NPM, right? And I want to believe that this was me that made something wrong, but otherwise somebody downloaded this 800 times and I'm scared, <laughs> I'm really scared for that. Uh, I don't think it's the pipelines. The pipelines are not really doing NPM install at all, right? And I mostly run NPM publish. I think I installed it twice. But, sorry, what did you publish in NPM? The hot stuff is published in NPM? Yes. Including the binary with the targets for our platforms. Oh, no, 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 no. But uh, how can I, I cannot sw swap my screens now? Stream failed. Oh, okay, one second. Da, that's it, I think. Yeah. Hello. Hello, so, welcome back. So, all right, okay. So the stream on Twitch was working properly. It's just this card. Okay. Yes. So the NPM package for this thing, right, downloads a tiny script that it checks your local architecture and downloads the proper binary. So you haven't installed it yet? My heart is broken now. <laughs> yeah. If you... I'd rather install it from Leandro, source. Leandro, yes. the second line on your readme should be how to install it. That's why I never install your scripts because I have no idea. I usually have to scroll to the bottom and install like a different, yeah, different language of the operating system. It's like, yeah. Wait for it to compile from source and then, and then use then it maybe once. I it. Yes. Yes. Like, I okay. need to put it in my home, like in the bash profile, and then fine, I can fine. Read. That's a good point. Uh, all right. So uh, essentially, you can just run npm install. Uh, you can use yarn as well. That's the thing. npm install, abstract machines, and that has a typo uh, slash hot stuff. I need to fix <laughs> but that. Is it a binary? Like no, no. So, okay. So let me, let me just show you what it does, right? It, you do ah. get a binary, but what yeah. you actually download as npm is this little JavaScript project. Uh, uh -huh. You can ignore the, the readme's copy there, again, um, that we go there. It has this uh, post-install script that runs the install.js uh, file. 
Oh, are you sure this works with yarn? Yeah, I actually tried. I don't I haven't tried it with npm. I tried it with yarn. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And um, this sort of um, uses the OS module to you know get your OS type and architecture, and then picks the right binary for your architecture, and then streams that binary, extracts it, right, and you know makes it available. How does it make it available? You ask. Glad you asked. Um, the package JSON says there's going to be a script called hot stuff in the same folder. And that means there has to be a file. So there is a file that is empty. And what it does is the install script replaces that file with the actual binary. And ta da! Okay, I'm probably going to pull request a way to do this as MPX directly. Yeah, please go ahead. Something that anything, anything is better than this. Thing? You don't have a contributing file? How do I? Dude, come on. I like just started <laughs> asking. <laughs> yeah. I can, I can try, I can try to, to run this locally and uh, make a pull request for a contributing oh, That would be nice. If you want to package it for NixOS, then I would love that. That would be fun as well. Right. There you go. That's the live stream. We turn this into a hot uh, Nix package. Yeah. That's a, that's a live stream there. And then we watch Fernando install it. <laughs> <laughs> Am I the only like Mac user now or? Uh, well, I'm using, I'm, I'm, I'm not running Nix OS. I'm running Nix on Mac. Ah, right, 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 right. Yes. But yeah. also it's a bit uh, finicky to install Nix on the latest uh, uh, Mac OS. I'm not sure if you have, I'm using Mojave still. So I'm going to swap the screen back to the terminal for you folks. I think it's this one. Perfect. Making a full screen for everybody. Um, the last thing we saw was the wait for changes function, right? That this script gets injected into any HTML that you download for so your browsing, right? And then this just makes a request after everything that you've done. So this, this is literally the last script to run on your page. And you know when he gets some response from the uh, the server, it will just sort of touch the files that need to be updated, and the browser will do the rest. That kind of works. Um, going back to the does it work in IE seven? No. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that's probably uh, a nice thing that we actually use in the browser. Like the, the browser is smart; it sees when you when you update the source or the href. It's like ah, you probably want to. Reload this you know, I, I thought the browser will do that automatically if you use a file protocol. Ah, okay. Yeah. But it doesn't. It doesn't. No. Anyway, so that's the serve function, right? It doesn't do much. It just injects that tiny uh, JavaScript there. Now, the interesting bit is the wait for changes function. And I think this is the fun part of the server, right? And it's also not that big. But you'll notice immediately that this is a loop. This is an infinite yes. loop, right? That's the loop keyword. It's a non-blocking is... infinite loop. It's almost like an event loop, right? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So what this loop does like is that it starts whenever you reach this part, right? So it's a long-lived HTTP request. And it uh, is delayed for a couple of milliseconds to give the CPU some breathing time. Um, so this could be even faster than it is right now. So it's artificially delayed, just saying. Uh, it, it computes the build graph, right? Um, it executes it, and it gets some artifacts. And I'm realizing now that I could just probably do execute there. I don't need the build graph to, to stay. It can go away. Cool. Now, after that, it checks how many artifacts have uh, been returned. If there are no artifacts, that means we didn't build anything. So we can just return control to the main runtime loop. So this is the promise saying, ah, I don't want to be executed anymore right now. Call me back when it's my time. And uh, if we do have something, then it will go through the list of artifacts. It will get the path, right? It will strip the actual uh, output directory from the path. Because remember, these files are, that are changing will have something like root, right? 
and then for example uh, public if that's the output directory and then styles dot main dot css and you don't want all of this stuff from there you want to remove that you just want to say this is the file that changed so we get that out of there and we just format this reply using uh, we don't use, even using a json library we're just like pretty printing a vector of strings which happens to be compatible so it's pretty you know pretty gross the way we're doing it here and we put that reply into a response that's an okay and when you do get this response in the browser then you will go through each one of these changes update the ones that you want and after you're done doing the updating then you will call this again and that's about it the thing that makes this possible is that execute actually returns the list of artifacts so this, li ah, right. yeah. this literally is uh, trying to build every couple of milliseconds, right? And if anything and does change... Using the same, you're using the same diff and the build plan for both, of, both parts of the... Persistent, yes. So when you call, uh, you know, if I go to the, the blog, right? If you go host stuff build, that builds the entire thing. I had a lot of changes there. Uh, but when you use serve, right? This is doing the exact same building under the hood. Uh, two, two comments. One of them is that I installed it. It works perfectly. Really? It's super fast. Yeah. Great what? Stuff. Crazy. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's uh, one comment. The other comment is um, you're waiting 100 milliseconds. Uh, I know from the libraries that I use in JavaScript that there is something called F events. I believe mm. it's a Mac thing. I only know about it because always the allocation fails. Yes. Like it always throws an error related to that. Yes. Uh, it, could it be possible or are you familiar with any way to listen for file system events instead of having a specific... Funny that you ask. My original implementation included a file watcher. And this is a working file watcher, right? That you start with a project, right? And you then start and then it sort of does the watching of the particular directory and it gets this notification events, right? And then it strips down the path and whatnot and sort of puts everything into the, the, the list of changed files. But this is so unreliable. It's, in, it's insane, insanely unreliable. Um, the events that I get are sometimes missing files, sometimes multiple times the same file. Like I've, I've tried doing this the first time uh, when I was just doing the library loading, right? So I would have the library loading on one side and that will be the server and that will be hot stuff. And then would, I would run Cactus, right? And I would expect this thing to pick up the changes. And sometimes it would, but some other times I had to recompile three, four times until the event was sent. Oh. And I was like- Can you do something external? Like instead of using JavaScript, you could use something like enter or like, uh... I know Facebook uses Watchman a lot, right? For like React Native. Oh, mind you, I, I was not using JavaScript for listening on, on files. I was using a, a, a Rust library called Notify, right? That's a wrapper around well, different oh, was, file oh, system right, right, specific right. libraries. Oh, uh, we are talking about the. Yeah. Uh, why, why, why did we mention FS events then? Uh, because Fernando brought up that in Node you do have these libraries. And I said, yeah, I implemented oh, right, right, this right. with yeah, similar yeah, libraries. Yeah. Oh, okay, 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 yeah. I was confused. I thought that you were using it. Yeah. No, no worries, no worries. Uh, I do not know if this is a problem that this library has, or in general, these things are unreliable. Um, I, I mean, I, I, th I, th I feel they are fairly unreliable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have problems with this everywhere. So <laughs> it was just curiosity. I don't blame you for doing a loop. It makes sense. No, no, no. I, I don't feel blamed. I just wanted to say that I have, like, my first instinct was, yeah, let's just use a watcher. That's the right thing to do. You know what I mean? And then it turned, like, I wasn't even trying to use the watcher to figure out what changed, just to trigger the build, right? right. And yeah. that will be unreliable. So I said, fuck it. I'm just going to run the build. It's fast enough anyway, so I don't have to care about it. Um, yeah. If you run the build plan with the, uh, with the server, and then the actual hot stuff use that build plan to build the. I mean, I mean, I know building the plan is really fast. It's probably just easier to do everything instead of like caching the build plan from the server and then using that build plan when you're actually building the website. Oh, so, so every 
I, I recreate the build plan essentially every time. Yeah. So the build plan is now being, so the build plan data structure is now being cached, right? It's recreated every yeah. time you run. Yeah, build. exactly. Yeah. Yes. But they could technically, they could technically, like if you, if you build the build plan within the, the server, then the, what do we call the not server, the, the website builder, the hot stuff. The, I guess then the, we could use, we could call it the build target. Yeah, the build target. Now the build target could reuse the build plan. Yeah, I guess it could reuse the build plan. If, I, if, if I save the, the data structure to disk, right? Yeah. Then it could read that if it's present and then do the diffing and so on. Um, yeah. My guess is that if, sure. if the project is like large enough for you to do this, then it will make sense. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, I had a benchmark in the examples folder, right? that I used to use for uh, cactus. And, and this is a fairly, uh, fairly large um, project that has, what? Is it really that? Okay, I, uh, maybe it's that, not as how big. How do I, as a user, know yes. which compiler, Rust compiler I should use? Oh, um, none. Downloading a none. If you use npm, then it's a binary that already runs for you. No, but I don't want to use the npm because npm is horrible. No, it's not horrible, <laughs> but I, I want to build it from source. Uh, just a stable okay. one. And I haven't tried it with anything that uh, rust up. What am I using? It's show. Uh, I'm running this one, stable, you know, 141. Yeah, uh, uh, okay, so this is 512 targets, and this actually starts to get a little slow because there's a lot of sequential I.O. action going on. Uh, it's still relatively fast, considering the second time is just nothing, right? And if you do serve here, then you are going to get, um, you know, amortized times of, you know, single digit millisecond reloads because you're not going to be yeah. changing the entire thing all the time. Yeah. Uh, but it would well, be I mean, nice to have, parallelize this. Yeah, if you have 400 blog posts on your blog and you're editing something, I don't think you're editing 400 blog posts like yes. par in parallel. It's, uh, yeah. Exactly. But it's consistently over 200 milliseconds. Yeah. Uh, however, Hot Stuff doesn't do something that Cactus did. Cactus did heavy parallelization. You could run Cactus, right? Cactus uh, build, if I go to the same folder. And you could tell it to use the number of jobs, right? And you can run like a thousand jobs if you wanted. And these are actual uh, threads, right? Okay. That was fun. That reminds me when uh, for the Reuniverse, when we downloaded a bunch of stuff and everything was uh, threads and like my Mac couldn't do it because uh, had this like limit on the, on my machine, how many jobs. Uh... Huh, it's actually not much faster. All right, I take what I, I take back what I said. This doesn't need to be faster. It's already faster than what it was before. Yeah. Anyways, that's sort of uh, the end of it. If we go back to the agenda. We went through the execution of the build graph. We went through the hot reloading. We did some interesting detours in there. We talked about void and impossible <laughs> types in uh, Rust and OCaml and by extension Reason as well. Uh, what else did we do? We even checked the reload thingy. Uh, we checked how to install the binaries from different platforms of an NPM package so multi-architecture npm binary distribution if you want to call it that <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know that was then i guess uh, you you'd want to put it up on cargo as well what do, what do you call it uh, yeah is it yeah i, I had thought it? of that like the rust uh... yeah, it's called cargo yes cargo i don't know how to do that uh maybe i can do this cargo publish oh god is this gonna work <laughs> 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 that was effectful, right uh, there. Okay, I have to ah, log in. Account. Right, but sense. do I have an? Yeah, I don't actually have a token. Hmm. Yeah. 
Oh, it's nice that it uh, allows you to create the token instead of uh, putting the password in there. I don't think I have a... Oh, I can log in with GitHub. Oh. Okay. This might actually be awesome. good enough that I can like, grant access to abstract machines. Yeah, just look at my password. Never... And that's a high point to end the stream, like publishing. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. New token. Oh, someone's going to use my token, aren't they? Okay, I'm going to recreate it after the stream. Token name. You... Please don't <laughs> use this. <laughs> Uh, I wonder how fast. Okay. Uh, they have to like do OCR and stuff. And now we find out that someone else has taken that. <laughs> okay, so I logged in already, so I'm gonna move that out. But let's see, publish. Manifest has no license or license file to, I guess I can say hello dirty. Yeah. Okay, let me just remove the agenda. No, the examples, cactus project file. Why is this dirty? Okay, I'm just gonna stash everything. And... Oh my gosh. Go. Uh, do you have cargo? I don't. Pontus? Yeah, I do. I just installed the uh, Rust up and the everything. So you should be able to do cargo install hot stuff after this and see if it works. Boom, I mean, boom. 20 minutes later after it compiles everything. Right? <laughs> I wonder how is it published? Is it published just as uh, hot stuff or is it like a namespace by your username? We'll find out. Great I never use cargo, that's fine. So if I go to hot stuff. Oh no! What? There's a consensus protocol called Hot Stuff. <laughs> no! It yes, it rejected it. No, no, it didn't. It, it didn't. Like, uh, something else. Yeah, you need a license still. Yeah. I guess I could copy the license file from somewhere. Beam. MIT license. Because why not? Of course. Year 2020 abstract machines AB. AB. Yeah, active a lot. Yeah. You surprised? I didn't know you had registered. Now you do. So eventually we'll pop up here. We have like 10 more minutes. I think we can publish a package in under 10 minutes. Maybe. I mean, <laughs> I'm holding my breath here. Yeah. I wonder if I can do scope packages though. I mean, if it publishes, it's too late. Yeah, like an abstract machine slash on cargo or something like yeah, yeah, nice. like this one over here. It feels weird to put it in a global namespace. Nah. But I have the... What, what do I actually use to run to compile the program locally? Oh, oof. Yeah, Sorry. I just did make. License, yeah, you can do make MIT. I think that's the only thing that's missing. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Kind of weird, it has to re recompile everything. Kind of weird that it requires you to have everything on. Mint. No, that makes sense. Sorry, what I did I say? I do stuff like this, like compiling the Rust. This is oh, what you notice, like uh, the five old, what, I, I don't, I've, five year old MacBooks. Are what, really did, what did I say? <laughs> I don't remember what I said. <laughs> what do you mean what you said? What what said, words did I utter? You utter the words that it's weird that it requires you to be have a clean git. Oh okay, yeah. then I said exactly what I thought I said. Yeah, all right. Yes. 
I was so confused for a second there. Uh, add license uh, to cargo package. I love how when I'm compiling my computer, like everything is got static in Discord and like it's dying. Yeah. Should really get a real computer instead of a Mac. Or like a slow laptop. I'm gonna flex. Oh, look at those cores. Compilation times have? zero. So um, this is a desktop. You're on a desktop. Yes. Wow, so quaint. I know, right? I can move. <laughs> was it 60, 64 cores? What was that? Uh, it's 30 it's cores. 64 gig RAM. It's a, yeah, it's 64 uh, threads that I can run in parallel. So it's a lot of computing power. So I assume that's a Ryzen. Oh. Come on. Why yeah. didn't it ask you this before yeah, you set the token? Well, my guess is that it's not being nice to me. So I'm, I I'm, am going to... I'm still compiling. <laughs> You'll be there for a while. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. I, mean, I used to still. compile Alacrity. I used to compile Alacrity from source. So I'm used to this. Do you like pain? Yes. All right. So now I confirm myself on a different screen that you can see. This is like those cooking shows where they like pull something out of the <laughs> table. It's like, oh, we have a pre-compiled binary here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, turns out it's already published. Yeah. It's going to say that. I'm expecting it to say that. I don't know why I keep trying. Mm. Yeah. Like we discover a security flaw and we have to overwrite the Tokyo. previous stuff package. Oh, yeah. Your computer compiles faster than mine. I wonder why. <laughs> yes. I can. Do you actually hear this? It is a mystery. Yes, I can hear it, actually. Like it's flying away. All right, so we're going to do one last chance, one last check. No, no. And we're going to try the namespaces. If there is a, a if there's like cargo namespace or... I do not know. My guess is that Are it's... Are you guessing? Yes, I think it's going to complain. Yeah, it's... about the git status. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was even before can... that. Uh, okay, so we are. we can definitely come up with a better name. I, I would like to call this Moo. Because it's super <laughs> tiny. Okay. Like it's probably taken. It's two letters. Yeah, a secure machine learning framework. All right. I guess we're not going to be publishing today. Don't believe it. And Moo has not been updated like in two years. Same for hot stuff. It's like a year ago. And he has nine recent. Yes. I'm not saying garbage collector. I'm saying, you know, we can clean up <laughs> we can clean up some of these things. Yeah. Anyways, I'm I'm sure it's a very cool. nice crate. But uh yeah, I think that we're uh we've reached the end of the stream. We've, uh, yeah. we've covered the entire tool from why we want to do it, right? Or why it was done. Uh, we've actually tried it in a couple of machines after the whole process of publishing the packages. We've gone from the command line interface and how to build it in this like rusty way, right? We've gone from there to building the, the whole computation graph that we need to execute, doing this sort of memoizations, so, you know, diffing of what needs to actually be done, what has changed or not, right? Computing the, the incremental, right, graph, computation graph, and then actually doing the work. And from there, we've gone to the server and making sure that we serve things fast uh, enough, uh, but also that we can detect when something has changed and update it in the browser without reloading the page, unless strictly necessary. The last thing was publishing. We figured out how to publish that to NPM, and now you can enjoy some hot stuff at home. 
Uh, that came out weird. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So for the next one, I guess. Maybe is that the point? Might... The name. So. For the next one, we might do then the um, reflection on the modular systems, right? Yes, I think that that that's a perfect thing to do after this. I'm just going to put some Donna Summer in the background while we close. Uh, you're going to get the uh, copy strike. Oh, shit. Well, yeah, don't do it. you know exactly what I was trying to play. Yes. Can yes. I sing it? <laughs> Maybe. If you sing Maybe. it poorly, then you do it. <laughs> so people don't realize that. Yeah. yeah. Come on, DMCA. Let me play my music. Yeah, yeah so we're saying, Fernando, <laughs> the, last, the, the next stream, we can definitely do uh, um, this comparison of module systems. It's, and I guess uh, you can take the lead on that one and, and figure out what exactly we're going to be talking about, like an agenda or something. Perfect. That's good. All right, everyone. If you like this live stream, don't forget to subscribe. There's no subscribe button on here. There's a follow on Twitch. Uh, this will be available on the YouTube channel. So don't forget to subscribe there. And if you like the stuff that we're doing, then consider supporting, not just following us on Twitter. My name is Leandro. This is uh, here. Fernando. You can follow him as well. And Pixel Hero is too complex for me to up. Yeah. I never know how to type yeah. in your... There you go. That's the one. I'm pawn to It's yes. a bad name. I don't want to stuck with it. Yes. So follow us. Uh, tweet at us. We might reply. We might not. And yeah, I hope you can stay reasonable. Take care. See you, folks. Bye. Okay, now I need to cancel Bye. this thing. How do I stop? There you go. Behind the scenes. <laughs>